<clears throat> this hearing of the Subcommittee on Immigration, Citizenship, Refugees, Border Security, and International Law will come to order. I would like to welcome the Immigration Subcommittee members, our witnesses, and members of the public who are here today for the Subcommittee's 11th hearing on comprehensive immigration reform. I'd like to particularly welcome our first panel of witnesses, courageous young people willing to be here today to talk about their own personal experiences and to help us learn about the problems faced by undocumented children. I commend you for your courage and willingness to be with us. Our series of hearings on comprehensive immigration reform began at Ellis Island, where we examined the need for comprehensive immigration reform to secure our borders, address economic and demographic concerns, and there we, reached our, we reviewed our nation's rich immigrant history. We have studied immigration reform from 1986 and 96 in an effort to avoid the mistakes of the past. We considered the problems with the proposed solutions for our current employment and worksite verification system in light of recent proposals by the White House to eliminate family priorities in immigration and replace them with a new and untested point system. We studied contributions of family immigrants to America and various immigration point systems used around the world. This week we had an opportunity to explore the importance of immigrant integration and their children into the United States. And just yesterday we explored the cost of immigration on our states and localities. Today's topic on comprehensive immigration reform the future of undocumented immigrant students is one area that Democrats and Republicans alike re agree must be fixed. As our witnesses on the first panel will personally describe, they had no choice in being brought to the United States at a young age. Now they are young adults who feel like young Americans, but without the same doors and opportunities that most of us had at their age. While the future is bright for their peers graduating from high school, and preparing for college across the country, this month for undocumented students, it's a future filled with uncertainty. They face college and universities requiring documentation of legal status, prohibitively high tuition rates, and no chance for federal financial aid for higher education. Even if they work hard and finish college, they must confront a bleak future in which they are unlikely to be able to work in professions for which they have trained because of their immigration status. Worse yet, they cope with the specter of deportation at any moment. If these young people get deported, many end up in the birth countries they have no memory of, a country they hardly remember and speaking uh, only English. These determined and dedicated young people need the chance to become productive members of our society. They never had a choice in their situation, yet our law blames them for it and makes them pay a heavy price. Fairness and justice have always been hallmarks of a great nation. We should not penalize innocent children for the actions of their parents. Furthermore, our nation is faced with ever-increasing economic competition from developed and developing nations. To effectively compete in an ever-expanding global market, we must ensure that we continue to have the most educated workforce in the world. Whether in college or in the military, we must give all qualified young people the opportunity to contribute uh, in ways that will keep America strong. It's time for this Congress to recognize the compelling economic, moral, and humanitarian concerns for, by providing these undocumented young people a way to a bright future. I would now recognize our distinguished ranking minority member, Steve King, for his opening statement. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I appreciate you holding this hearing, and, and I appreciate the witnesses that are here to testify today and had an opportunity to at least meet our first panel. And uh, I... Um, I, I reflect that often we legislate by anecdote here in this Congress as opposed to uh, taking a look at the broader statistical data that tells us where society might go if we move forward on pieces of policy. I also reflect there's an existing law, that's yes, in 1996, that was authored by our ranking member of the, of the Judiciary Committee, Lamar Smith of Texas, that requires that if a higher education institution grants an in-state tuition discount to someone who is unlawfully present in the United States, they shall grant that same in-state tuition discount to all citizens of the United States who otherwise qualify, wheresoever they might live. Um, if we don't adhere to that law, then we're granting a status for those who are unlawfully present in the United States and a tuition discount that's greater and disproportional to that of a citizen who might live in another state. Uh, for example, my daughter-in-law grew up in the Mississippi River bottom, uh, farmed right up next to the river, and her father did, within sight of Iowa, 
and went to school in Iowa uh, at Iowa State. But those of her circumstances were not qualified for in-state tuition. They had to pay the higher rate. Yet, in some of those circumstances in states around the Union, in a number of states, there's that the discount is provided to those who are unlawfully present and those who want to go to that same institution that don't happen to live perhaps in that state pay the premium. And I'll submit that that's an inequity. And I'm watching as piece after piece of legislation comes through this Judiciary Committee, through other committees here on the Hill that set up sub special protected status, different levels of citizenship, disadvantages for citizens that live in the United States and who they and their parents presumably uh, paid taxes and engaged in the responsibilities of citizenship and puts them at a disadvantage. And all of our hearts go out to people that aren't in control of their own destiny. Um, and I recognize that you, the witnesses here before us in this panel represent that uh, a cross-section of those who aren't in control of their own destiny. By the same token, the United States of America needs to be in control of its destiny as well. And I look across the, the hill to the Senate side, and as we're putting together the pieces of what they talked about yesterday, and we have very little text of any language, just concepts that were unrolled, rolled out in the press conference yesterday, it uh, becomes clear that um, at least that coalition is determined to provide a broad amnesty plan. It can't be called anything else. And anyone who ha can claim that they came into the United States prior to January 1st of 2007 would get a provisional legalization until such time as they could figure out how to make it uh, a little bit more formal and a path to citizenship for almost everyone um, that can claim they were in the United States. So the questions that don't get answered here in this committee or out in the public debate sphere and not by our president, I might add, are what should the population of the United States be in 25 years or 50 years? Who should be allowed to come to the United States? And who should be sent back to the country of their origin? And if a nation isn't willing to send someone home who's unlawfully here, how in the world can they claim they have a border or have an immigration policy whatsoever? Should that immigration policy be set by people who come here illegally and the mass of those numbers weighs on our conscience so much, our, our, our consciences so much that we're willing to sacrifice the essential pillar of American civilization, American exceptionalism called the rule of law? Because that's what the Senate's poised to do. The Senate is poised to sacrifice the rule of law because they can't find it in their heart to look someone in the eye and say, I'm sorry, rule of law is more important. Everybody has a certain cross to bear. But we have an obligation to the destiny of the United States of America, and we need to move it to a higher destiny, not a lower destiny. That is not an indictment of the ladies that are here in front of us today. That is a statement of the essential pillar of American exceptionalism that I fear will collapse under the weight of the policy that was advocated in the Senate yesterday. And so with that, and with that in mind, I'm looking forward to hearing the testimony from the witnesses before us today. And Madam Chair, I'd yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. I'm pleased to recognize the chairman of the full committee, uh, Chairman John Conyers, for Thank his you very opening much, statement. Madam Chair, I uh, rise in defense of President George Bush's position on immigration, which he will be shocked and hopefully pleased to know that we do have one point of agreement. Uh, I uh, asked the question, though, uh, back to our friend from Iowa, well, what should we do with the children after we look them in the eye? And who makes the rule of law? Uh, I, I thought we were all weighing in it, on it and that it was not some permanent static uh, set of rules and so I, I join uh, uh, the notion that the DREAM Act concept of Howard Berman's and, and this creating a pathway toward assimilation is a, a pretty good start for mutually putting together a, a reform package for, 
for youngsters who, if they uh, prove themselves, are good students uh, who uh, participate in some concept of national service, uh, we could work our way through them because they're, in a way, the best citizens in a family uh, in which they're helping their parents and the community uh, get the idea of what this is all about. They learn the English first. So uh, I want to hear from them, and I, I think this is an, an excellent part of our series of hearings that uh, Chairwoman Lofgren has constructed thus far. And I thank you for the time. Thank you, Chairman Conyers, and uh, without objection, all members of the committee will uh, be invited to uh, place their opening statements in the record, and uh, I especially appreciate the willingness of all members to do that since we have the author of the DREAM Act here on our panel, Mr. Berman, who has uh, uh, helped us so much in putting our legislative efforts uh, together, and we have been following him on that. We have two distinguished panels of witnesses here today to help us consider the important issues before us. I would like to extend a warm welcome to Marie, Marie Gonzalez, a member of Westminster College's class of 2009. Ms. Gonzalez was born in Costa Rica and came to the United States when she was five years old with her family. Raised in Jefferson City, Missouri, she graduated with honors from Helios High School, one of Missouri's top secondary schools. She was a member of the National Honor Society, the Foreign Language Club, the tennis team, and the track team. She also volunteered extensively for the Vitae Society and the youth group at her church. She was recently chosen by Latina Magazine as one of their Women of the Year. I'm also pleased to introduce Martin Kala, a graduate of Hamilton College and Syracuse University. Ms. Kala was born in Lusaka, Zambia. After relocating to the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Ms. Kala came to the United States with her mother. After the death of her stepfather and her mother uh, when she was 15, Ms. Kala came to study at St. Anne's Belfield School in Charlottesville, Virginia. She excelled at St. Anne's and she earned a scholarship to Hamilton College in New York. Graduating in 1993 with a concentration in political science, Ms. Kala next received her master's in public policy administration from the Maxwell School for Citizenship and Public Affairs at Syracuse University. She now works as a financial analyst for the New York Public Library in New York City. And finally, I'm pleased to welcome Tam Tran to our hearing, a graduate in the class of 2006 at the University of California, Los Angeles. Born in Germany after she and her parents fled Vietnam, Ms. Tran's family came to the United States to reunite with their family. In December, Ms. Tran graduated from UCLA with a degree in American Literature and Culture with college, departmental, and Latin honors. She now works as a full-time film editor and videographer. She has also been accepted to a Ph.D. program in Cultural Studies at UCLA. Each of you have a written statement, which I have read and found extremely powerful, those statements in their entirety will be made part of the, uh, the record of this hearing. We ask that you summarize your testimony in about five minutes, and when you have one minute left, the little machine there on the table will switch to yellow. Uh, so we ask that you try and stay within the five minutes. We will not be throwing the gavel at you, however, if you need a few minutes to wrap up. And then after you've all testified, uh, we will, each of us, have an opportunity to pose some questions to you. So if we could start, Ms. Gonzalez, with you. Good morning and thank you. Like she said, my name is Marie Nazareth Gonzalez. I am 21 years old um, and I'm a junior from Jefferson City, Missouri, currently attending Westminster College in Fulton, Missouri. I'm majoring in political science and international business with a focus on communication and leadership. My family is originally from Costa Rica. I was born in Alajuela, Costa Rica, but have been living in the U.S. since the age of five. My parents, Marvin and Marina, brought me to the United States in November of 1991. 
Having come over legally, their plan was to become U.S. citizens so we could one day all benefit from living in the land of the free. We sought to live the American dream, the promise of a better education, a better life, and altogether a better future, what any parent would want for their child. Strong values and good morals have been instilled in me from a very young age. As long as I can remember, my parents have worked very hard for every dollar that they've earned, and in the process have taught me that life is not easy and I must work hard and honorably for what I want in life. On April of 2002, after an anonymous person called the governor's office where my father was working, our immigration status came into question. Later on, it was confirmed that we were undocumented. From that day forward, my life became a haze of meetings with attorneys, hearings, and rallies. When they heard what we were facing, deportation, the community that knew us in Jefferson City rallied behind my family and me to an overwhelming degree. They knew that we were hardworking, honorable, tax-paying people, and they fought to allow us to stay in the United States. Members of our Catholic parish, where my mom worked as a volunteer Spanish teacher and after-school care director, joined with other community members to form the Gonzalez Group to rally support by collecting signatures, petitions, and organizing phone calls. My classmates, teachers, and others also got involved because they considered me to be an important part of their community. I became involved in advocacy for the DREAM Act um, right after my senior year of high school. Unlike thousands of others like me who would benefit from the DREAM Act, I had little to fear from speaking out since I was already facing deportation. When I was asked to, be, to give the valedictorian speech at the mock graduation in front of the Capitol, I became a national symbol for the DREAM Act. Eventually, all of the work of so many people on my behalf began to pay off. My representative, Ike Skelton, and both of my senators, Mr. Jim Talent and Mr. Kip Bond, responded to the support from the community. They got involved in the effort to keep me here. Eventually, though, all of our appeals were exhausted, and a final date was set for my family to leave the country, July the 5th of 2005. I appeared on national television, once with Senator Durbin at my side, and was contacted by the media so often that I got tired of it. I thought, even if it's too late for me, it might help someone else, and it might help the Dream Act pass. On July the 1st of 2005, I got word that the Department of Homeland Security would allow me to stay and defer my departure for one year. My life since April of 2002 can be easily compared to a roller coaster. There have been times that I have felt like I was on top of the world, living out mine and my parents' dream of being a successful young woman in college, only to be brought down by the realization that it can be taken away at any moment. The deferral of my deportation has been renewed twice, each time for a year. Last month, when they gave me until June of 2008, they told me it would be my last renewal. If the DREAM Act does not pass by then, I will have to leave, and I will not be able to graduate from college. I am only one student and one story. In the course of fighting to remain here, I have been lucky to meet many other students who would also benefit from the DREAM Act. Unlike them, I can speak about this issue in public without risking deportation. I share with them in their fear and their pain and uncertainty. I can personally attest to how life in limbo is no way to live. I have been torn apart from my parents for almost two years and have been struggling to make it on my own. I know what it is like to face difficulty and how hard it is to fight for your dreams. No matter what, I will always consider the United States of America my home. I love this country. Only in America would a person like me have the opportunity to be standing in front of you. Many may argue that because I have a Costa Rican birth certificate, I'm Costa Rican and should be sent back. But I tell you, I don't feel that way. I hope one day not only to be a U.S. citizen, but to go to law school and to live in D.C. and to continue advocating for others who cannot speak for themselves. Whether that will happen, though, is up to you, our nation's leaders, and to God. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we'll hear from Ms. Kala. Good morning. My name is Martine Wange Kalau. I'm a proud New Yorker employed as a financial analyst with the New York Public Library, and prior to that, I was a budget analyst at the New York City Mayor's Office of Management and Budget. 
Although I've lived in the United States for 22 years, I have an immigration nightmare I'd like to share with you. In August of 2004, I was ordered deported. My mother brought me to the United States on a tourist visa from the Democratic Republic of the Congo when I was four years old. She fell in love with and married my stepfather when I was seven years old. When I was 12, my stepfather died. And when I was, when I was 15, my mother died. My mother had been granted a green card and was in the process of applying for permanent U.S. citizenship at the time of her death. However, neither she nor my stepfather filed papers on my behalf. Thus, when my mother and stepfather died 11 years ago, I was left not only without parents, but without a path to citizenship. Although I had no home, I was able to excel through my academic performance and through self-parenting. I attended prep school in Charlottesville, Virginia, with the assistance of a judge who acted as my benefactor. After graduating from St. Anne's Belfield School, I attended Hamilton College in upstate New York on a scholarship and graduated in 2003 with a concentration in political science. All of this time, I knew that I had immigration problems, but it wasn't until in college that I came to fully extent, understand the extent of those problems. I needed a new social security card in order to secure a part-time job on campus. But when I naively went to the Social Security Administration for the card, they referred me to INS. The next thing I knew, I was in deportation proceedings. That's when my nightmare began. I persevered while my case was pending, despite the looming prospect of removal to a country in Africa where I would not be fully accepted and do not know the language. Soon after college graduation, I, I was a recipient of the Margaret Jane White Full Scholarship, which allowed me to graduate with a Master's in Public Administration from the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs at Syracuse University in 2004. Academia became my security blanket that allowed me to be something other than that scarlet letter I for illegal immigrants. Despite my academic record, I cannot escape the stifling nature of my immigration status and have therefore been unable to fully explore my full potential. My experience foreshadows what happens to immigrant students if legislation is not adopted to squarely address our status we will be left in limbo while with a lot to give back to America, but without provisions that will allow us to do so. While I have been uplifted by the U.S. educational system, I've also been marginalized by the U.S. immigration system. In 2006, I met other potential Dream Act beneficiaries who, like me, were facing deportation. They included Danelle Padilla, who graduated graduated second in his class from Princeton University last year, and another young man who finished law school at Fordham University, a third boy, a sweet and bookish teenager, and honor student, talked about how it felt when the immigration and customs enforcement agents came to his home in a case of mistaken identity, but ended up arresting him anyway. He said, and I quote, they made me feel like a criminal and I am not a criminal. My particular story has a happy ending, I think. In the summer of 2005, I began to work closely with Susan Douglas Taylor, my current counsel, beacon of hope and constant support. In the spring of 2006, the Board of Immigration accepted my application for adjustment of status and remanded my case back to the immigration judge for a background check. Unfortunately, the immigration judge put me through a series of hearings and sent my case back to the Board, to the board of Immigration Appeals to reconsider their decision. This nearly broke my faith. Just last week, my lawyer, Susan Taylor, informed me that the Board of Immigration Appeals granted me an adjustment of status and my case is won. However, I am apprehensive and I do not know how to process this information because I've been let down so many times with immigration law that my heart fears any more disappointment. Furthermore, 
The timing of the decision also means that I may not qualify for a work authorization and I may lose my job after May 24th. Although my immigration nightmare may almost be over, it is just beginning for countless others. I was very apprehensive about coming here to speak with you today in this very public forum. I worry, perhaps irrationally, that it might, in some way, have a negative impact on my case. God knows that I've gone to the depths of human frailty in trying to deal with my immigration situation. But it is my obligation to do what I can to prevent this anguish for other students. So I'm here today on behalf of many talented and hardworking individuals who, like me, have grown up in the United States but who cannot tell their own story because if they did so, they would face deportation. I hope that hearing my testimony today will help them by making it more likely that the DREAM Act will become law this year. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tran. We have an audiovisual aid here because it's trans from California. <laughs> if you may begin. Documented student side? No. I'm originally from Honduras, from Colombia, but my parents are Chile, from Peru. From Argentina. Came here from the Philippines when I was three years old. I've been here about 12 years. I came here when I was four years old, three years old, two years old. Seven years old. I'm a physiological science major with minor English, political science major, international development studies. First year, a psychobio major. An English major. A math major. A chemistry major. A double major in, in American literature and political science with a concentration in American government. Before, I had no idea that if there was anybody else in my situation, you feel completely alone. After graduation, I don't really know what to do because I realize that a lot of legal issues will hold me back. I really want to be a doctor. But that is a little bit impossible for now. So I'm going to keep working on it. My immediate goal is to apply for the School of Public Health. And then I will put a medical Now we're here struggling in our, you know, in our own, and hoping to make it, hoping to dream, right, and hoping those dreams to become a reality one day. I coach a basketball team. I really like math. School is my life. <laughs> After college, I want to go to grad school. I want to go to medical school. A community college English professor. Become a public English lawyer. Be an actuary. The journalism field. And uh, practice law for 20, 25 years. Very goal to become a Dream of being a professor one day. Do research on technology and the workforce. Hopefully one day I'll be superintendent at LAUSD. Thank you, Ms. Tran, for sharing that work. Now we'd like to hear from you. Okay, just testing. All right. Um, so my parents and I escaped. Well, my parents escaped the Vietnam War as boat people and were rescued by the German Navy. They lived in Germany as refugees, and during that time I was born. My family immigrated to the United States when I was six to reunite with relatives who had fled, Cal who had fled to California. In the U.S., my parents applied for a political asylum because they no longer considered communism. Ms. Tran, could you move your mic a little sure. bit closer so we can hear? That would be great. Okay. Okay. Um, is that better? Yes, it is. Okay. Thanks. Um, all right. I'll start over. Good. So we can hear you. Okay. Um, my parents escaped the Vietnam War as boat people and were rescued by the German Navy. They lived in Germany as refugees, and during that time, I was born. My family immigrated to the United States when I was six to reunite with relatives who had fled to California. In the U.S., my parents applied for a political asylum because they no longer considered communist Vietnam as their home. Despite this, they lost the case. The immigration court ordered us deported to Germany. However, when we um, met with the German consulate, they wouldn't accept us because we weren't German. Germany does not grant birthright citizenship. 
So I may have been born in Germany, but I'm not German. And my parents are Vietnamese, but I have never been to Vietnam. The truth is, I consider myself culturally an American, as I have been American-raised and educated for the past 18 years. Recently, I graduated with honors in American literature, was immediately hired full-time as a filmmaker by UCLA, and was accepted to a PhD program in cultural studies. However, the issues I faced as an undergraduate are coming up again. The difference this time is I'm 24 years old. I suppose this means I'm finally grown up. I'm an adult with a college degree. It's been my dream to be an academic researcher and socially conscious filmmaker, but I'll have to wait. The PhD program awarded me two large fellowships, but it is still not enough to cover the 50000 per year tuition. I recently declined the offer to the PhD program, um, and I thought that with my new job, I can save up for graduate school next year. But three days ago, the day before I boarded my flight to D.C., I was informed that it would be my last day of work. Um, my work permit has expired, and I won't be able to continue working until I receive a new one. Every year, I apply for a renewal, but never have I received the permit on time. This means every year around this month, I lose the job that I have. Um, I'm lucky to be here today to share my story and to give voice to thousands of other undocumented students who cannot. But I know that when I ret return home tonight, I'll become marginalized once again. Since I can't legally work now, I know the job that I'm going to look for when I get back isn't the one I'll want to have. The job I'll want, because it makes use of my college degree, will legally be out of my hands. Without the DREAM Act, I have no prospects of overcoming my state of immigration limbo. I'll forever be a perpetual foreigner in a country where I've always considered myself an American. But for some of my friends who could only be here today through a blurred face on video, they have other fears too. Um, it may not seem like graduation can be a scary thing, but for us, there's the huge fear of the unknown after graduation. Graduation, for many of my friends, isn't a rite of passage to becoming a responsible adult. Rather, it is the last phase in which we feel like we belong to this country. It is, our, it is the last phase in which um, they feel a sense of belonging as an American. As students, my friends feel part of an American community, that they are living out the American dream among their peers. But after graduation, if the DREAM Act does not pass, they will be left behind as they cannot obtain a job that will utilize the, the degree they've earned. My friends will continue to be faceless, undocumented immigrants. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks to all three of you for being here today and sharing your personal stories with us. I will note that uh, we there are many undocumented uh, students in America trying to grab the American dream, but we were only um, uh, prepared to hear from students who had already uh, been out in the, um, in the attention because we did not want to put a young person at risk, and so we saw those blurred faces, and you are speaking for all of them today. I'd just like to say before asking questions uh, how proud I am of each one of you. I mean, your personal stories are tremendous, and the achievements that you have made uh, academically and personally uh, can only give me hope for our country and with people, young people like you uh, to forge us ahead. I, I think any one of us would be delighted and proud to have someone like you as a daughter, uh, and, and I just am overwhelmed that you have been willing to come here today. You know, I um, it's hard to know uh, what to ask, uh, but I'm wondering if you each could tell me uh, what ways you think and plan that you can contribute to the United States if we're able to remove this immigration cloud from you and you just have a free path to contribute to America, each one of you, what, what, what is your dream of your contribution to our country, starting with Ms. Gonzalez? Um, I would like to become an attorney one day, and I'd like to work um, for advocacy. Um, like I stated in my um, testimony, as far as for people who are underrepresented, uh, whether that will still be immigration or other issues. Um, I'd like to be involved with that, and I'd like to pursue more community service, be, you know, on a board of something. So. Ms. Kalaha. 
Yes, um, I'd like to just explore all the different opportunities um, in terms of my career, something that I haven't been able to uh, do uh, fully. And um, I'd like to also give a voice to other individuals in my situation um, in terms of getting involved in nonprofit organization work, um, speaking at other forums such as this, and um, being able to not just have the three of us here, but to have a group of individuals um, speaking on behalf of this, uh, this legislation uh, without fear of the backlash. Ms. Tran. Um, like I mentioned, I'd, I'd really like to get into academia, so I, uh, I'd like to get my PhD in American Studies, and I, I want to be a part-time lecturer, and I also want to get involved in um, documentary work. I'd really like to start a production company that translate, translates academic work into um, the film media, and I'd also like to get involved with nonprofit organizations. A nonprofit organization. Um, I'm really interested in creating an oral history for um, individuals of marginalized communities. Well, each one of you has stated your interest in making a commitment not to go make a ton of money, but to make the country itself richer through your efforts. This may not be a question that you can answer, but let me ask you, because I'm sure you've thought of it, what do you think your future will be like if you are deported to the country of your birth, Ms. Gonzalez? Um, that's kind of an interesting subject for me as I just recently received my extension. Um, the extension was granted to me about a month ago um, with the remaining 60 days. Um, I was originally scheduled to depart June the 22nd. So um, around this time, for the past couple of years, I've always mentally prepared myself for knowing that, you know, I've tried everything, um, knowing that um, I've given my all, and you know, if I have to leave, I've always said um, I would leave, but I'd always consider um, the U.S. my home. It'd be very hard for me to go back. Of course, I would love to see my parents. I miss them so much. Um, it's not even I can't even put it into words. But um, I also know that my dreams would change um, as far as knowing Spanish. Um, I can speak it very well, but as writing level to be in college there would be difficult. Um, I could do it. I'm a good student. I know I could, but um, I mean, I don't know if my family could afford it. It's just, it would be a whole mess of things that, I mean, of course, I, I hope that that's not the case, and I hope that I do get to stay, but I have to realistically think about it. So, thank you. Ms. Kowal? Well, for a while that um, had been my greatest nightmare because um, it's debatable as to which country I would be deported to, whether it would be Zambia or the Congo, um, but neither would be a relief to me um, as the Congo is, has been a war-torn country for several years, um, uh, more than a decade. And there's dire poverty, uh, there's no strong economic, economic structure there. And Zambia, being a country right near the Congo, um, is no better off. Um, both countries are uh, they're ridden with HIV/AIDS. Um, a lot of circumstances in which I fear that I wouldn't be able to survive. Do you speak the language of either of those countries? Um, in Zambia, it's it's English uh, is the first language. However, in the Congo, French is the uh, official language, which I don't speak. Well. Ms. Pram, my time is almost up. Um, I mean, you're right. I'm not really sure how to answer that question. I've been asked that before, and it's kind of like, I don't know. Um, but I mean, I have i don't have any connection to Germany. I lived there. Um, I went to part of kindergarten there. I don't speak German. Um, all I know of its history is what I've learned in American history about, you know, World War One and World War Two. I've never been to Vietnam. I speak it at about a kindergarten level. Um, I don't know. I can't even even imagine like being in Vietnam. I've never even been like in the Eastern Hemisphere. I have I have no idea. Thank you both, all of you, very much. And I will now uh, turn to the ranking member for his questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I do want to thank you for your testimony. And uh, I reflect as I listen to each of you speak that... Um, 
I'd speculate that no matter where you might have been or might be born, uh, no matter what your circumstances in life, you're the raw material that would be successful in any environment. And I think you've proven that, and that's one of the reasons that you're here today. Um, and Ms. Kalaw, it, um, you know what, when, when there's a piece in your testimony, and I don't see it right in front of me, but uh, where, where you say that you went to the depths of human despair. And I see you here before us now, and I'm wondering what that did for you how did you how did you respond when you were to the depths of human despair? How did you overcome that to be here today? Well, it's it's been an interesting journey because um at the oh, same excuse me, depths of human frailty. Yes, absolutely. Um at the same time, I think um my counterparts can attest to this. At the same time you're falling apart, you're in deportation proceedings, um, and you don't know from day to day whether the immigration services will come to your home or not. Did it make you stronger? Um, it, it did make me stronger. Um, what I was basically trying to say was you have to, it's almost like living a double life essentially. You still have to try to survive. You still have to go on. There are no other choices. What? The other, your only choice is to essentially give up and be deported to a country you don't know. What, what language did your mother speak? Uh, she spoke several. She spoke um, French, Lingala, Kikongo, Kibimba, a number of languages. English? Um, she spoke English. Okay, okay. she wasn't... Um, Better than you speak French? Yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> I took and French in high school and, and a little in college, and that's the extent of my okay. French. Well, Anna, thank you. And uh, Ms. Gonzalez, the, um, the advocacy here for the DREAM Act what would you have to say to those young people that are paying or their parents are paying or they're, they're signing student loans for, for expensive tuition that they're paying because they're an out-of-state student that don't qualify for that tuition that you're asking for as the symbol of the DREAM Act? How would you reconcile uh, that position? What would you say to them? What would you say to my daughter-in-law who's still paying student loans? I think as far as in-state tuition, I personally go to private um, college, so this doesn't affect me, but... I think as far as I understand it, um, it leaves it up to the state to choose whether or not um, they want to do in-state tuition. Well, actually, and the law says that they have to offer that same discount to everyone and they're in violation of a federal law that can only be resolved if there's a lawsuit filed in civil court. So, uh, but what you have to, I mean, I ask you to reconcile this from a moral perspective. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you, if you sat down in the student union and uh, you're looking those students in the eye who are going to carry a debt, some of them for many, many years, and they're paying a higher tuition rate. Not your particular case, but what you're advocating for. How do you reconcile that? What's fair? What's moral? Um, I think as far, I, obviously, I, I haven't um, really prepared for this, but um, I would say, I mean, it's, it's a tough call no matter what I say. Um, and I know that we side differently, but I would, I would go ahead and say if a student like me who's gone to school in Missouri for as long as I have, I would feel that I would qualify for in-state tuition as opposed to a student who would come over from Arkansas who would buy, only be moving in. Because in your view, you'd be a resident of that state yes, and of their exactly. qualification. exactly, and I have okay. contributed to the state. And, 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 and we'll disagree there. But, but so then, then the following question would be um, this, that the Senate's announced that they want to grant um, lawful present status, and I'll put that in quotes, to everyone except those are obviously felons who arrived here in the United States by January 1st of 2007. Anyone who arrives after that apparently is not included in that. Do you think that's appropriate? And what would you say to that person that arrived here January 2nd, 2007? Could you look them in the eye and say, I think you should be sent back home to your home country? And if we can't do that, how could we then enforce any immigration law whatsoever? How could we actually have a border here in America? I think the main problem, though, is that we need to start somewhere, and I think that that's what they're trying to do. I think that's been our toughest. But could you problem. look them in the eye? And say, oh, I, think no, I would never be able to look anyone in the so. eye and tell them that. But doesn't somebody have to do that? I, but I mean, people have told, looked me in the eye and told me that. So. I mean, it's easier, be easier for me to take your position than it is for me to take mine. But I, I revere this rule of law, and I think one of the reasons that you're all here is to escape that lack of rule of law in the countries that you left. 
And so I don't want to recreate that circumstance here in the United States where slowly we erode this rule of law that is the attraction that brings such talented people here to the United States. And I thank you very much for your testimony and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman's time has expired. I would uh, call now on the chairman of the full committee, Mr. Connors, for his um, questions. This has been uh, one of the most moving uh, hearings on immigration that I've attended, and I'm trying to figure out why, because uh, there are unnumbered cases of personal hardship, immediate fears, uh, continuing uh, harassment, uh, a non-resolution of a problem that follows you around. And here are 535 men and women lifted out of 300 million in America to decide this question. And of all things, you are here to help us decide this question. So we have enormous responsibilities uh, because a lot of people are making up their minds as to what to do. I'm, make, I'm trying to decide about that January 1, 2007 deadline. I don't have any better answer than anybody uh, in this hearing room. But that's our job. And here are three young, brilliant, attractive, talented people from Costa Rica, Zambia, Congo in your background, Vietnam, Germany. And here's what occurred to me, and, and you can tell me what my discussion engenders in, in your thinking this morning. Here are 6.3 billion people on the planet Earth and growing. And almost everybody seems to want the same thing. We want to succeed in life. We want to try to follow our dream. Uh, it doesn't seem to be any different. Uh, maybe you're typical of the way most people in 192 other countries feel about this. So tell me, tell me how how you think what we're doing here is going to maybe help or change the circumstances. Um, I definitely am a believer in um, just, you know, getting both sides. Um, and I think that the more that we discuss, the more that we learn. And I think that that's the best thing that we can do is inform ourselves um, to the very, or to the maximum capacity. But, um, I mean, just these talks in the last few months especially, um, I think are, have been very productive and will continue to be productive. And I hope that we do reach um, a good Solution. You you reminded me that also the American people weigh in on these decisions. It isn't really just us senators and us congresspersons. Uh, the American people are influencing us as well. Mm -hmm. So they're they're looking and listening, trying to get this straight. Should we keep all these people? Out? Everybody wants to come to America. You know that's a line. Uh, we got to draw the line somewhere. Um, I think it, it it is important to, in addition to exploring the comprehensive immigration reform, reform we should also explore the Dream Act because it speaks to individuals such as us, which um, the other legislation may not fully address our particular individual um, situation and the American people, they they know 
individuals such as us. We are, I like to think, um, the girls next door. So um, <laughs> this is um, so it's important to have individuals such as us speak, and I think that help would help the legislation. Yeah, I just wanted to add on to that. I mean, you know, when somebody is deported or is affected by immigration, it doesn't affect just that one person. I mean, um, for example, I also tutor at UCLA, and when I lost my job on Tuesday, I had to email all of my tutees and tell them, you know what, sorry, but you know, I've, I can't help you with your finals anymore. I can't help you um, do any of those things. And so, I mean, it's you know, if something were to happen to any of us, it affects not just our families, but maybe you know, U.S. citizens who. Um, it'll affect our friends, it'll affect the schools we go to, the places that we work. It, these are just not like individual cases, it affects everything that we're involved in. Thank you all so much. Gentleman's time has expired, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Gilmer. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and I've really uh, appreciated your testimony and uh, sympathetic to your circumstances. Uh, I was in the uh, back room watching uh, by television, but I was also on the phone, ironically, as things go, uh, talking to my oldest daughter. I, I have three daughters, so I'm kind of got a soft spot for three <laughs> females sitting here. But um, anyway, it was rather ironic, I thought, concluding her conversation. She's in a country several time zones away and was telling me about um, how strict the immigration was and problems she's having and uh, she concluded the conversation by saying she'd heard that, uh, that Congress may have a resolution on the immigration issue. And I said, well, the Senate may have. Uh, we've still, we're still dealing with that. She said, well, I love you and good luck on your immigration issue. And I said, well, I love you and good luck on your immigration issue. But uh, anyway, I appreciate um, hearing the, um, the stories you each have and obviously Everything we do here affects real lives and makes it difficult, but thank you. I, I really don't have any questions, but appreciate the testimony. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Gilmert, and he yields back his time. Mr. Howard Berman, the author of the DNA, is recognized for five minutes. Well, uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. I want to echo the, the, the words of our full committee chairman, uh, both about to this panel and about your decision to hold this hearing, uh, uh, like like so many of your decisions in this area, it was I think uh, an inspired one, and I, I thank you for doing it. If for no other, well, there are many reasons, but for personal level, uh, hearing the three of you talk, uh, it sort of re. It re-inspires me about what some have referred to as legislating by anecdote, uh, the stories of real people and what's happening to them is what, and one particular story that got me into this six or seven years ago uh, uh, regarding what was happening to people. And the thing I respect about the 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 ranking member of the subcommittee is it's clear he, he is his perspective on these issues is not coming from some obsession or uh, calculation of how it's going to impact his political situation in his district he he clearly he both he clearly feels and articulates the fears and concerns he has about the approach that uh, that many of us are are taking on these issues, um, and that allows one to sort of understand and try to deal with and respond to people who don't see it the same way that we do. And and I respect him for for doing that. But but I do want to just rather than ask questions, just try to join issue on a couple of the points that he has made in, in his comments. Um, first, this notion of sort of in a somewhat, perhaps even in a little bit of a dismissive way, legislating by anecdote. The day that, 
that the 535 members here divorce themselves from the stories of what's happening to people uh, as a result of our laws and our policies is uh, the day we really ought to close the institution down uh, because, uh, yes, there is a tremendous place for uh, uh, witnesses with expertise and statistical information and an ability to extrapolate the consequences of changes of the law and, uh, and, and science and informed opinion, but somewhere it has to start with how real people are impacted by the existing state of the law and whether or not that, that is a cause for changing the law. So I don't take the notion of being motivated to try and change something because of it anecdote, a story, a true story about uh, a, an individual, a family, a, a group of people and what's happening to them as a result of that law as, as bad. I take it as the best way to, uh, to get us engaged outside of this Washington culture context that the, the thing that tends to happen to us when we run around from day to day voting yes, voting no, introducing bills, but and deciding what's our priority and what do we really want to accomplish. The second thing is uh, a point was made by the ranking member that I think has to be clarified. You are not here in this country because you made a decision to leave a country that didn't have the rule of law. You didn't make the decision to be in this country. You had you had essentially no role in that decision. It was a series of circumstances. Uh, uh, we can have different feelings about the decisions that the, uh, your, your parents and others made that brought you here, but the one thing no one can argue is that you are here because you some, made some decision uh, uh, that this is where you wanted to be. This is where you found yourself, and you are three stories of people who took the cards you were dealt and have done a, a remarkable job with them. And, uh, and, uh, and, and the third point is the randomness and the craziness of the present situation. Why the three of you face certain consequences while hundreds of thousands, millions of others, because an anonymous caller hasn't yet called about them, because the faces on your film are still blurred, uh, uh, haven't yet faced that consequence. They just live in constant fear that they might face those consequences. And uh, a situation, and that's what the status quo is. Because if we don't do something, the one thing I know is we're not going to have a systematic policy of finding everyone who is in your situation and removing them from here. It's going to continue to be a whimsical, random, unfair, very selective process of an arbitrary process of who gets out and who stays in uh, and, and that's not good either. So the absence of an alternative effective strategy by the people who rail against what we propose uh, I think should be noted. So my time expired, I don't know how long ago, but I yield back and thank you. <laughs> thank you. Sir. The um, gentleman from California, Mr. Lundgren, is recognized for five minutes. Yeah, it was compelling. We can't hear you, Dan. Is the line is it? okay? I may come at this from a little different perspective because I was here along with Mr. Berman back in uh, 1986 and I was the Republican floor manager for Simpson Mazzoli. So I either get the credit or the blame for uh, gathering sufficient Republican votes uh, for that bill that legalized um, several millions of people. At the time, we said it was going to be a one time only legalization. We said that because we were concerned that we had to deal with the problem of a large number of people who were here illegally under our laws, and we wanted to resolve that situation and, and do what the gentleman from California has just mentioned that we want to do now. Um, 
settle the situation with those who had roots in the community for a sufficient period of time, but have employer sanctions and enforcement so that we wouldn't reach this situation in the future. Well, the legalization program worked fairly well. We didn't do any enforcement. The concern I have as we come to this legislation is do what what we do now, does it create a repetition of what we did in 86 with the idea that instead of settling things, it acts as an encouragement for more people to come into this country illegally. And so you each have very compelling individual testimonies, and they may be so compelling that they would uh, merit private legislation, but that is different than making a determination with respect to the general law. And so what I would ask you is this, because this is a question I'm going to have to answer to my constituents. If we were to pass the uh, DREAM Act and settle all of the notions resolving doubt in favor of those individuals who came here, um, let's say who came here illegally, let's talk about that group as a result of their parents' decision, out of fairness to those in situations such as yours and others, would that and could that, and should we as legislators be concerned about it happening, encourage others to continue to break the law even after we set a new bill into law? Because the payoff is, even though they break the law and come here, they're giving their children the best gift they can possibly give them, the potential to live in the United States full time and to, at some point in time, make a very compelling testimony that out of fairness, they ought to remain here. Should we be concerned about that? Or is that one of the things that, although it's of some concern, um, it is so insubstantial compared to the merits of the a situation supporting DREAM Act that we ought not to consider it. I, I just wonder what you might think on that. Um, that's a tough question, but um, I would say, I mean, you know, stepping aside from my own personal story, um, I would say that it's, I mean, obviously enforcement is a key issue in all this. Um, you know, if we were to do this, how would we enforce it so that what happened in 86 wouldn't happen again? Um, but I think that, I mean, these stories, these kids, I mean, so many of them are Americans, like not talking for my own personal, you know, but I mean, it, I, it just, it would seem so unfair and logically, I, I don't see how we would, um, be able to, you know, be able to remove every single person. I know that a lot of people would end up being removed, um, if we could, but even budget wise and stuff like that, I don't know how that would happen. So. I think this would more likely be more of a benefit to the country than, you know, difficulty. I don't know. I mean, yeah. I, I see that that's the kind of thing we have to wrestle with. Um, we had a commission established by President Carter <clears throat> right around the time I was here the first time. And one of the co-chairs of that was Father Hesper, the president of the university I graduated from. And he made a statement in which he said, we must close the back door of illegal immigration so that we can open the front door of legal immigration. And Ms. Tran, I would refer to some of the testimony you gave earlier about how what happens to you or, or someone else similarly situated not only impacts you, but other people, family members, folks you come into contact with. But let me look at it from a slightly different perspective, which is if we don't control illegal immigration, the sentiment in the country may very well be to slam the door on legal immigration. And what do you say to someone who, let's say, um, was from Vietnam or the Congo or somewhere else, who didn't come here illegally but stayed in their country and waited for the number to come up to allow them to come in? Or let's take the Philippines where they have a huge, huge list. Uh, it affects them as well, their family members, their brothers, their sisters, their parents. What, what, what would you have me say to them? And I don't want to 
unfairly put you on the spot, so if you think it's an unfair question, don't answer. But that's one of the questions I have to answer as well when a family member comes to me and says, I've had somebody I know in the Philippines who's waited 15 years. They can't get their number because of the, the quotas are all fixed up, and yet people who didn't follow the law have the benefits. The gentleman is given 30 seconds by unanimous consent, so Ms. Tran can answer. Um, well, I, I don't know the direct answer to I don't know what you would say to your constituents, but I can say that I think the reason some people um, do things in a way that is not in line with the law is because they don't have a path to do it legally. Um, and if, if, some, if the people who came to this country, you know, by crossing the border without the, the right paperwork, it, you know, nobody really would prefer to do that over doing it the right way. Every, like my parents wanted to do everything the right way. I know a lot of people would have preferred to do everything the right way. They'd have, they would have preferred to pay the money that they would have, had, would have had to do for that security of being in this country legally. But because some people don't have the avenue to do that and some people don't have um, the legal means to do that. This is the only choice that they have, and this is what some people have chosen to do, to take that risk to come to this country. The gentleman's time has expired. We will recognize now the gentlelady from Texas, Ms. Uh, Sheila Jackson Lee, for five minutes. Allow me to echo uh, the overwhelming joy uh, that we sense by the testimony that you've given. I don't believe that you really should be burdened by 1986, uh, what happened in 1986. I imagine looking at you, you were not born in 1986, and so um, you probably will study that by way of history, but you certainly uh, won't uh, do it going forward. I heard one of my colleagues indicate that uh, your adversity has strengthened you and I would argue that uh, probably all of your life experiences have done so. But I would just uh, indicate that the horrors of segregation and racism in America probably strengthen many who are African American. But would we choose to go through it again or continue to go through it? I think not. So when we think of adversity, it may strengthen persons, but if we can find a way to enhance their lives and our lives without the oppression of those kinds of horrible experiences, why shouldn't we do that? And I think uh, it is apropos to the conditions of individuals who've come to this country not of their own initial will, as my colleague has said, uh, and therefore how we treat them uh, clearly should be from a different context. And so I want to raise these questions. This is a very important hearing because it has been in the backdrop of the hearing we had yesterday or the day before that spoke about uneducated, undocumented immigrants, a burden to society economically and socially. This is a wonderful example of the emerging undocumented students from pre-K to where you are who are striving to be contributing citizens uh, and have a presence here and can contribute. From your background and your array of activities, there is no doubt. Let me pose uh, these questions. And, and might I just, for the record, have you note that many of us who are here in Congress are first, second, or third generation immigrants. I happen to be one. So I think it is uh, important to know where you can go in your life you might not want to be here, uh, but it does speak to what education can do. Could you just tell me, uh, what do you find good about America? And if you can go quick, I have three questions. I want to get uh, all of them in so we know who we're dealing with when we talk about all the students that may be impacted by the DREAM Act. For me, it's the opportunity and um, just the education. Okay. Thank you. I would have to echo that and say it's the education. Um, it's been my way of surviving. It's given me open doors and given me a family also. I think I'm going to third that and say um, the education. I mean, among me and all of my friends, it's 
the way that we've, it's the path that we've used to self-empower ourselves. My next question, do you feel a sense of loyalty and pride and patriotism about America? Oh my goodness, yes. Every 4th of July I stand up there and I cannot wait till the day that I'm a citizen and can proudly say that I am. I've been to those ceremonies. They are emotional. You, the tears come to your eyes. Uh, are you a teary person about patriotism and loyalty? I am, very much. So you feel it in your heart? Oh, I do. Hardcore. <laughs> Cal- yes, absolutely. And I can't wait until the day that I can vote in the United States. Ms. Tran? I mean, same here. I mean, it's something that my friends and I always talk about. We always feel like we're like the ultimate Americans because it's something about that we don't have access to. You know, we always say like, oh my gosh, we would totally go vote if we could. We would totally do all of these things if we could. I know that the percentages of uh, undocumented, many of them are children. Do you think in your generation anyone is against being Americanized and learning English? Many of us have bills that have all these components. Is anyone against that, even if you are proud of your original heritage? Are you against becoming American and proud of being a part of that mosaic pot? I would say no, because most of the kids, um, I mean, have been born in, or have been raised. So, I mean, pretty much we kind of just automatically acquire it. I, I don't know. Happily so. And some of you are bilingual. Yes. When coming to America or living here, there's a strong desire to be part of the American culture and American dream. So, um, no, there is. We don't have to be frightened of a divided America, immigrants wanting to be over in the corner over here as opposed to being part of the wholeness of this country. No. From your perspective. Ms. Tran? Not at all. I mean, all of us are just trying to fit in. I mean, we're still here, right? I mean, all of us have the choice to leave, but... (laughs) You're ready to stay. Yeah, we're I thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to note the uh, horrors of deportation that these young people have faced, and uh, I think it's important that we listen to their stories. I yield back. General Lady's time has expired. The gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Gallagher, is recognized for five minutes. Yes, thank you so much for your very uh, poignant and, and, and powerful stories. Um, you really give a, a human face to this issue. Um, Ms. Tran, my uh, younger daughter is from Vietnam. So your presence here provokes a uh, uh, a reflection on my part. She's adopted, obviously, and uh, she could be sitting there. Um, maybe we should adopt the three of you here on this panel. Um, but I've already paid for that education. I don't know if I want to. You know, I, I think that... The, the DREAM Act that has been crafted by Mr. Berman um, is really uh, part of a jurisprudence in, in the United States that recognizes um, that children should be treated differently. Um, in a previous life, I was a, a prosecutor. And... For years in this country, there was just a criminal justice system until it was recognized that children needed protection. Um, We have child abuse laws. But back decades ago, people like those of us on this panel uh, in states throughout the United States uh, decided We needed a juvenile justice system. Um, We have the age of majority because we recognize that with children, particularly those who are incapable of forming an intent, deserve to be treated differently. They are children, no matter where they come from. And I think that really is something that those of us that will be making these decisions have to think very carefully about. Um, And your stories reinforce that. You came here at very tender ages. You don't know. You indicated, Ms. Tran, you've never been to Vietnam. We hear about the rule of law. One of my colleagues indicated, I think it was Chairman Kanye, said it's not static. Law is 
a process of change and a reflection of hopefully moral principles. Just imagine in these cases, would it be moral to send these three young women to a place that they have never been where they don't speak the language, where they don't understand the culture. You know, America, above all, is a moral country. We fail sometimes. But this Frenchman who came here in the 1800s had this to say about America. And I firmly believe it. America is great because America is good. Gentleman yields back. The gentle lady from uh, California, our council, Ms. Linda Sanchez. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, and I want to thank our three uh, witnesses on the first panel for having the courage to come here and share your stories with us today. I know that it probably takes a great amount of strength to come forward, and it can be a scary process. And so um, I want to thank you for having the courage to come. And just listening to your testimony, each of your stories is heartbreaking um, in a different way. Um, while I was listening to your testimony, I realized that you're not much different than I am, actually, uh, because your parents came here from other countries with the hopes of giving you the kind of opportunities and better life, um, just like my parents did. My parents came from Mexico. Uh, you've all struggled hard, and you've succeeded academically and uh, in many other ways as well. Uh, just like I did, and you all identify with the American culture, speak English fluently, and you are patriotic and love this country just like I do. But the little difference uh, that remains between you and me is that I have a piece of paper that tells me that I'm a citizen, and so I was able to pursue my dreams, um, to pursue my education and uh, do things like practice law and eventually run for Congress. And as I sit and look at you three, I think about <clears throat> the infinite number of possibilities of things that you could contribute to this country if you were just given the chance. Um, so your testimony today, I, I, I think Mr. Delahunt said very, um, very eloquently, puts a human face on what the policy decisions are that we as members of Congress have to make. Um, I want to ask the three of you, did, did any of you three have a say um, in deciding where you wanted to live or in deciding to come to this country? Did, did, did any of you decide one day that you were going to come here? I was five, so my parents told me we were taking the trip and we might, if we liked it, we were going to try and stay, and that's what happened. Can anybody else have a... No, I, don't, I didn't have a say. I remember being a child, practically a toddler, coming to the United States. Um, same as Marie, I knew we were going on a plane somewhere on vacation, and I remember pointing out a calendar once we got here. Like, when are we going back on this day? And I didn't really know what a calendar was. Okay. But, um, but yeah. So clearly, you didn't wake up one day with the decision that you were going to come to this. Kind of, do any of you feel like lawbreakers? Like you personally are a lawbreaker for for having come to this country, since you didn't really have a say. I've never felt like a lawbreaker, but I have carried a burden of shame with me for many years. But that's not that's not a shame that you that you chose yourself. No, it's a shame that others imposed. Yes, absolutely. On you, thank you. Um, I'm interested in knowing. You you just mentioned uh, loving this country and and feeling like you're American through and through and wanting to stay and and be a part of this country. And you mentioned a couple of examples of things you really can't wait to do, like become a citizen or, or vote. Um, how would your lives change if you were able to become legal permanent residents or citizens? What other things uh, are you waiting to do or would you love to do if you could be told, yes, you have the certainty that you'll be able to stay in this country and pursue your dream? Ms. Gonzalez. Um, wow, that would be such an amazing um feeling that would be such a weight that would be lifted off of my shoulders. I think I'd 
go back to being a little kid and just run around like crazy and be so happy. But uh, I think I would definitely um, take full advantage of that and um, try and um, contribute as much as possible again and give back to the community that has given so much to me. And that's what I've really been fighting for because I have had that support from my community. Ms. Klein? Um, I'd be well, I'd, I can't wait to further develop relationships with individuals in my life. Um, up until this point, it's been quite stifling because I've always had that burden of the integration that is weighing on me. It's true. Um, I further pursue my education. For example, I really wanted to apply to UT Austin for graduate school, but I couldn't because I couldn't afford out of state tuition and things like that. Uh, one last question. Um, do you think ultimately that if you were not allowed to remain in the United States, that the countries to which our country would send you back would accept you even? I can actually attest to that because um, throughout all the media that I've done um, in the past, um, there have been times where I've been, um, I mean, there's been a backlash against, you know, how much I've tried to fight, you know, and they would know that I've been trying to fight to remain in this country, and they're like, well, you know, why are you coming back then? And it, it, would, it would be difficult. Um, I think the biggest issue would be if I were ever allowed to come back um, to the U.S. That would be something very difficult for me to, you know, if I was told I can't come back for eight years with my parents, that would be very hard for me to deal with. Come on. Because I was born in Zambia, but I relocated to the Congo um, right after my birth, uh, the Zambian um, country does not technically recognize me as a citizen, it's still questionable, and the Congo does not recognize me either because I don't have a Congolese birth certificate. So, so there, there's a lot of uncertainty there where, where they would send you. Absolutely. This trend. Um, I already mentioned it in my testimony, but I mean, like, Vietnam doesn't even know I exist. And Germany's already said that they wouldn't accept me. Thank you, Anna. Thank you very much. And thank you very much to this panel. Your testimony has been compelling. So this is the uh, 12th hearing we've had. I'll just tell you that much of the testimony we've received has been, you know, what do we want for immigrants in this country? We want people who speak wonderful English. We want people who have great educations. We want people who are assimilated and who love America. Um, this, you're the answer to our dreams, and uh, hence the DREAM Act, um, which we are grateful to Mr. Berman for uh, introducing. I will say that the DREAM Act actually doesn't even mention uh, some of the issues that have been raised, but merely allows young people in your situation who didn't make the decision to come to earn legal status to getting your education or serving in the U.S. military. So um, we will, uh, we may have additional questions. If we do, we will forward them to you. And uh, But we do appreciate your willingness to be here. I think that your testimony has certainly touched my heart, and I think will make a difference in this debate as we move forward. Madam so, Chair. Yes. May I like to ask if, if you yield after you finish? Uh, I will yield at this point. Uh, let me uh, just... Uh, double echo your emotion and your comments, but I'd like to ask unanimous consent to submit an article, AP uh, Impact Immigration Raid Split Families. Without objection, the article is entered into the record, and I would uh, just like to conclude. Thank you very, very much. We're going to have the staff uh, get in touch with you and get all of your contact information so that we can keep in touch with you. It's been an honor to meet you. and. Um, to see the, the success that you three have achieved in our country and we hope that through our efforts here in the Congress that we will create a new rule of law that will allow you to fully participate in this country where you have been raised. So thank you very much. Now call the second panel if we could.
Thank you uh, all, second panel, for taking the time to speak with us today. Um, First on the panel, I am pleased to introduce Diana Furchgott Roth. I hope I have not destroyed the pronunciation of your name, but you will correct me if I have. A senior fellow and director of the Center for Employment Policy at the Hudson Institute. Prior to her arrival at the Hudson Institute, she served as the chief economist at the U.S. Department of Labor. Between 2001 and 2003, she worked as the chief of staff for President George W. Bush's Council on Economic Advisor. Under President George H.W. Bush, she was the deputy executive director of the De Domestic Policy Council and associate director at the Office of Policy Planning. She received her bachelor's degrees uh, from Swarthmore and her master's from Oxford University. Next, I would like to extend a warm welcome to Dr. Alan Cameron, a retired high school computer science teacher from Phoenix. After receiving his bachelor's and doctor doctoral degrees in elementary education from Arizona State University, Dr. Cameron taught for nearly 30 years in Arizona's public schools. Drawing from his work as an electronics technician in the United States Navy, Dr. Cameron co-founded the Falcons Robotics Team at Carl Hayden High School in Phoenix. The team has competed at three national robotics championships, winning second place in 2005. In 2004, university underwater, uh, uh, in a 2004 university underwater robotics competition, the high school club, whose team comprised four Mexican immigrants, in, <clears throat> gained nationwide attention when they trounced the nation's top engineering programs, including that of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology at the competition. And I'm a big fan of the first competition. Congrats on that. We're also pleased to have Jamie Marisotis with us, the president and founder of the Institute for Higher Education Policy, one of the world's premier higher education research groups. Mr. Marisotis played a leading role in founding the Alliance for Equity in Higher Education in 1999. And in September of last year, he helped establish the Global, <coughs> excuse me, the Global Center on the Private Financing of Higher Education. Prior to his work at the Institute for Higher Education Policy, Mr. Marisotis directed the Bipartisan National Commission on Responsibilities for Financing Post-Secondary Education and assisted in the creation of the Corporation for National and Community Service, or AmeriCorps. Finally, I'm pleased to welcome the minorities witness, Dr. Chris Kobach, a professor of law at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. Professor Kobach joined the faculty of the University of Missouri in 1996 and he was awarded a White House Fellowship in 2001 to work for then Attorney General John Ashcroft. Uh, Professor Kobach continued on after his fellowship as counsel to the Attorney General. He earned his bachelor's degree from Harvard University, his law degree from Yale University, and his doctorate from Oxford University as a Marshall Scholar. Each of you will have your entire written statements made a part of this record. Um, but we do ask that you summarize your uh, statements in about five minutes. Uh, when you have one minute to go, those little machines on your table will flash yellow, and that's really the time to know that you need to start winding up. And when your time is up, it flashes red. And I will say most witnesses are always surprised because the time goes very quickly. Uh, but we do hope to keep you within the time frame because we have many members here who will like to ask questions. So, Ms. Furch Scott Roth, am I too far off on the pronunciation? No, that's great. Uh, you are recognized for five minutes. Okay, let's... Uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to testify today. I'd like to say that 25 years ago, I was in a similar situation to these young people. I was here in the United States legally, but I did not have a work permit. I was fortunate to be able to marry an American citizen. And 24 years of happy married life and six children later, I hope that the United States is not sorry that I was able to gain my citizenship. Many undocumented students, such as uh, the ones we've heard from today, don't have the papers due to various personal circumstances. Nevertheless, I'd like to say that their presence in America would benefit us because they're hardworking and talented and produce streams of income taxes and Social Security payments that bolster our fiscal position. One indication of the potential benefits of undocumented immigrant children is to look at how well their peers, the legal immigrant children, do as they grow up. Many of these young immigrants become high achieving students and then outstanding workers and entrepreneurs. 
Many of the top students in merit-based high schools, such as Stuyvesant High School in New York, are children of immigrants. The undocumented immigrant children might do just as well, if not better, especially given the difficult circumstances they had to go through. What the DREAM Act seeks to do is, through the rule of law, fix the problems of these undocumented students. According to the Migration Policy Institute, 360,000 young people fit these criteria, and about 715,000 other young people aged 15 to 17 could become eligible in the future. This total of uh, about 1. million potential workers represents 0.7%, less than 1% of our labor force. Even if this number were to double or triple because of the incentives that some of the members mentioned this morning, it would still be only a tiny fraction of our workforce. Even though these undocumented young people are a small group, they have the potential to make an important contribution to our economy. If their status is regularized and they're placed on a path to becoming U.S. citizens, they would be able to get a college education and a well-paying job. The DREAM Act would vastly increase educational attainment regardless of in-state tuition provisions. It would cause a much higher percentage of undocumented immigrant children to finish high school. Further, it would cause a much higher percentage of undocumented high school graduates to go to college. The DREAM Act would allow students who graduate from college to use their degrees in the fields that education prepares them for. This makes the educational investment worth it both for the students but more importantly for the rest of us. It will help us as well as them because we have more productive citizens who fill needed job openings and who can pay taxes. And the United States needs these young workers who are presently prevented from working through no fault of their own. Our global competitiveness is enhanced by attracting bright young people such as the ones we've heard from today. We live in an open global economy and we're continually competing against other countries. We want firms to locate and expand in the United States, creating jobs here rather than going offshore. In order to do that, we want to keep the smartest entrepreneurs and workers here. Sometimes we hear that our economy cannot handle more immigrants, but economic facts do not support this. In 2007, the United States leads the industrialized world in job creation, and our unemployment rate is among the lowest. Because our job creation is so strong, employers are complaining about a shortage of jobs. Steve Bircham of the American Surfing Association, which represents surfing firms such as Manpower Inc., reports that his companies are having difficulty in attracting enough skilled workers. Microsoft chairman Bill Gates also reported a shortage of workers, testifying on February 7, 2007, before the Senate Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions. He said, and I quote, Americans' need for highly skilled workers has never been greater and he called for an increase in the number of permanent residents, skipping the bureaucratic H-1B visa process altogether. He said, barring high-skilled immigrants from entry to the U.S. and forcing the ones that are here to leave because they cannot obtain a visa, ultimately forces U.S. employers to shift development work and other critical projects offshore. If we can retain these research projects in the United States by contrast, we can stimulate domestic jobs and economic growth. In conclusion, passing the DREAM Act and granting young people the right to stay in the United States is a win-win situation. There are no reasonable arguments against it. In fact, America would benefit if every foreigner who graduated from college had a green card stapled to his diploma. As all of you wind down your lengthy negotiations and start the process of making a law on immigration reform, you should keep one question in mind. Why send the Martin Kalaus, the Tam Trams, and the Maria Gonzalez's of the world back to their country to compete against us here? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Cameron. Uh, good morning, and thank you, Chairwoman Lofgren, Ranking Member King, and members of the subcommittee. I am a recently retired teacher from Carl Hayden High School in Phoenix, Arizona. Although I was employed as a computer science teacher, I spent much of my last six years with fellow teacher Freddie Lejvardi and the Carl Hayden Robotics team. We participated in the first, for inspiration and recognition of science and technology, robotics competition, which combines the excitement of sport with science and technology. 
It has changed the culture of our school and the dreams of our students. The Carl Hayden Falcon Robotics team made news a few years ago when their underwater robot competed in a university category and won. It demonstrated what our kids, actually what all kids, were capable of achieving. Beating MIT that year was big news. We consistently rank among the top three schools in the university division, still beating MIT and other universities. Canada is hosting this year's underwater competition. We will not be attending because we probably have undocumented students on our team. Besides, MIT deserves a chance. <laughs> Carl Hayden High School has over 2,000 students, 92% are Latino. It's estimated that 60 to 80% of our student body are undocumented, brought into this country by their parents as children. There are 1.7 million other undocumented minors transplanted into our society. While living in the U.S. and being educated in our school system, these children become Americanized. They repeat the Pledge of Allegiance, liberty and justice for. They root for their favorite baseball and football teams, and they ponder their future. Cindy's parents brought her here to the United States from Mexico at the age of 12. When she was a high school sophomore on the robotics team, she asked Mr. Lejvardi and me if we'd help her prepare for college. We had her taken out of the ESL classes and enrolled in honors classes, eventually earning college credits while in high school. Graduating with top marks, she entered the local community college to become a nurse. She is finishing this month, her second year this month, and when she receives her RN certificate, she'll continue her education in pre-medical program. She wants to become a pediatrician. Of the 12 graduating seniors this year on our robotics club, 11 have been admitted to Arizona State University, nine with ASU scholarships, six will be in engineering, which is phenomenal for a high school. It's over the top for Latinos, and half of them are women, which is another whole scale that we're, uh, one in science and one in pre-medicine like Cindy. This has been the way it's been going in our club for the last five years. 65,000 undocumented students graduate from U.S. high schools each year. The men, by law, must register for selective service, yet they cannot volunteer to serve our country in the military. Valedictorians and straight-A students can go to college and receive degrees, yet cannot be employed, even in fields where we have critical shortages of skilled workers. A routine traffic stop can result in immediate deportation, a loss of our intellectual capital they'll take years to replace. While American Educated Cindy is unemployed, we try to recruit 10,000 South Korean nurses to immigrate into the U.S. to ease the projected shortage of nurses. The story of the kids in the Falcon Robotics team has been published in magazines like Wired, Reader's Digest, and in high school textbooks. Warner's Brothers has brought their movie rights to the young engineer's story. Hardworking kids who can overcome all obstacles and compete with the best is an American tale. The gritty students of the Falcon Robotics team have become role models to young people nationwide, positive examples of the American can-do spirit. Yesterday at the FDR Memorial, I read the inscription, no country, however rich, can afford the waste of its human resources. Our bright, moral, hardworking students need the opportunities to serve our country. If two public school teachers in downtown Phoenix can cultivate talented students into champions of the community, assets, not liabilities, imagine what we can accomplish with the help of the United States legislator. Imagine what can happen if we don't. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Cameron. Mr. Marisotis. Thank you very much for this uh, opportunity to be here. Improving access to higher education continues to be one of the most important investments that we can make in our collective well-being. The simple fact remains that increasing educational opportunities results in tremendous public, private, social, and economic benefits. We know that workers who've gone to college tend to have higher salaries, higher savings, more overall productivity, better health, and increased life expectancy. Higher earnings for college graduates result in more revenue for government expenditures, through increased tax collections, and through budget savings from avoided social expenditures. The social benefits of higher education range from higher voting rates to more charitable giving and volunteerism. In short, by investing in those who might not otherwise go to college, we're investing in our united future and well-being. 
It's not simply that it's the right thing to do, but that it's in our collective economic and social self-interest to do so. In today's America, realizing the American dream is almost impossible without some post-secondary education. Unfortunately, not everyone who graduates from high school and is qualified to go to college is able to equally and adequately benefit from post-secondary education. Many immigrants face significant barriers in gaining access to and succeeding in higher education. These prospective college students must struggle with inadequate finances, heavy work and family responsibilities, varied academic backgrounds, limited English proficiency, and a lack of knowledge about the American system of higher education. Even for immigrants who arrive in the United States as children, as we saw from the prior panel, navigating the American educational system may not be easy. Many young immigrants struggle to learn English and keep up with their classes in elementary and secondary school. Foreign-born teenagers ages 15 to 17 make up about 8% of that age group overall in the total population, but represent almost 25% of high school dropouts. Undocumented students may be less motivated to complete high school if they believe that higher education and the better paying jobs available to someone with a college degree to be an unattainable goal. Undocumented immigrant students face an array of barriers to college access and success. In a time of rising college costs, when the average tuition and fees for a public university have increased by 96% over the last decade, many of these students must pay out-of-state tuition and in some cases are even charged international student rates. Even in the 10 states that currently offer in-state tuition to undocumented students who've graduated from state high schools, undocumented students are not eligible for the federal and state financial aid that assists their low-income classmates. They also cannot legally work to support themselves while in college. They cannot even legally drive themselves to their college classes, a burden for those who must live with their parents in order to be able to afford to attend college. Faced with these obstacles, Students who've lived in the United States for much of their lives may well watch their high school classmates go to a college that they cannot afford and then take jobs for which they will not be able to legally eligible even if they can manage to complete a college degree. As a result, the investment already made in these students' primary and secondary education has no chance of paying off for the nation. If you consider what our national workforce needs are in the specific sense of human capital, it's clear that we're looking at an enormous shortage of educated workers in the not too distant future. Already, we're seeing corporations recruiting overseas in critical workforce sectors like technology, and by 2020, we'll be looking at an employment gap of about 14 million people needed to fill jobs that require a college education, according to Census Bureau projections. Investing in those who are already here is our best hope for remaining competitive on a global scale. Congress can address these deficiencies in educational and economic competitiveness by making com comprehensive immigration reform a reality and by passing the DREAM Act. The DREAM Act is a common sense piece of bipartisan legislation that provides these talented and industrious future workers with a pathway to citizenship so that they can support themselves while attending college and eventually use their college education to pursue their professional goals and aspirations as American citizens. Immigrant students have the capacity the motivation, and in many cases, the academic preparation needed to complete a college education, but too many of these students are forced to grapple with a system that was not, a, not designed to address the modern day barriers to their success. I urge you to implement the simple, rational policy adjustments contained in the DREAM Act that recognize America's changing population and the important role immigrants play in our future global economic leadership. Thank you very much. Dr. Kobach. Madam Chairman, members of the committee, it's an honor to be before you today. Uh, in addition to being a law professor who teaches constitutional law and immigration law, I'm also a litigator who uh, litigates on behalf of the Immigration Reform Law Institute, which represents U.S. citizens and supports the uh, interests of immigration enforcement. Uh, of particular relevance in that regard is the fact that I'm representing U.S. citizens in the case of Davey Bond, which is an instance where U.S. citizens are being discriminated against by a university, in this case the Kansas University system, that provides uh, beneficial in-state tuition rates uh, at roughly one-third the cost that the U.S. citizen plaintiffs are paying in that case. Uh, when I did serve in the Justice Department, I was Attorney General Ashcroft's uh, Chief Advisor on Immigration Law. As you, you are well aware, and as uh, Representative King mentioned, uh, in September 1996, Congress passed its Immigration 
uh, Reform Act of that year, and a central provision of that act now codified at Title VIII, Section 1623 of the U.S. Code is the provision that says in so many words, an alien who is not lawfully present in the United States shall be eligible for any po shall not be eligible for any post-secondary education benefit unless every citizen in the United States is also eligible for that benefit. In other words, no in-state tuition or grants unless U.S. citizens from out of state also get those, get those grants. It was a simple non-discrimination provision that said illegal aliens should not be discriminated in favor of and against U.S. citizens. Um, Congress in 1996, I think, did not anticipate that some states might simply disregard federal law, but that's precisely what happened. Uh, in 1999, the California legislature passed a bill uh, that gave in-state tuition to illegal aliens. Governor Gray Davis, many of you may not know, vetoed that bill in 2000. In his veto message, he said, federal law prohibits us from doing this. He also said in his veto message that it would cost the state $63.7 million to subsidize uh, this education. Uh, undeterred, the California legislature, legislature came right back and passed the bill again. In 2002, in a slightly different political climate, uh, Governor Davis signed the bill, ignoring his previous veto message. Uh, most states that have considered such bills giving in-state tuition to illegal aliens have rejected the idea. However, nine states did follow uh, California's example. Now, in relatively small states like Kansas, it's about 300 students who are taking advantage of this benefit. In big states like Texas, uh, it's about 6,000 students. And in California, it's estimated that over 16,000 students uh, are taking advantage of this in-state tuition. I would argue that this is a, a bad idea for three basic reasons and that the DREAM Act, which essentially retroactively legalizes this giving of in-state tuition to out-of-state, uh, to undocumented uh, aliens, is also a bad, bad, reason, a bad idea for three reasons. The first is that it, it discriminates against U.S. citizens. Uh, for example, in Kansas, take the case of a Missouri student who's played by the rules all his life. Uh, he then goes to Kansas University and pays roughly three times the amount of tuition that an undocumented uh, student would pay. Uh, this is particularly harmful at a time when the cost of education is going rapidly beyond the reach of many Americans. College costs rose 35 percent between 2005 and 2007. That's after adjusting for inflation. Uh, Two-thirds of college students now graduate with debt with an average of just under $20,000 worth of debt. And in an era of limited resources, I would argue that U.S. citizens should be first to get those resources. Second, it places a heavy burden on taxpayers. In Texas, it's estimated that the in-state tuition for illegal aliens costs taxpayers 40 to $50 million a year. In California, it's over $100 million a year. But perhaps most importantly, it discriminates against those students who are here lawfully. Indeed, under the terms of the state statutes and under the terms of the DREAM Act, in order to qualify for the benefits, you have to be illegally present in the country. So we heard from the first panel uh, from three individuals who are here under different circumstances. Ms. Kala and Ms. Tran would actually not be helped, and if the three of them were to attend a university, only Ms. Gonzalez would get the benefit of in-state tuition and would get the benefit of the Z visa, which is an extremely easy way of remaining in the, in the United States, whereas Ms. Kala and Ms. Tran would pay three to four times as much. Now, where is the rationality in that? It does not make sense that those who are lawfully present, like the, the latter two of those witnesses, should be treated differently than the, because they have tried and struggled to follow the law. Furthermore, Aliens inside and outside the United States are sent this message. If you go through the hoops and you go through the bureaucratic hassle of trying to follow the law, which is admittedly difficult, then we will punish you in the United States by making you have a standard student visa, an FM or J visa, which will not automatically renew like the Z visa will, and will be a tough road for you as you try to adjust your status. But if you're illegally here, you get in-state tuition and you get a much easier path to citizenship. I would submit that that is patently unfair. Thanks to all the panelists for your testimony. We'll now begin our questions, and I'm going to turn first to the chairman of the full committee, uh, Mr. John Conyers, to begin the questioning. Mr. Conyers. I don't think it's... It, here. This should be better. Uh, I wasn't in 
intending on uh, discussing this question, but uh, Attorney General Ashcroft's former advisor has raised a, a point that I don't remember any of the three previous witnesses making in terms of the differentiation uh, in tuition payments. Now, under the DREAM Act, we, we, we would fix this by uh, creating a, the legal status uh, uh, that would make moot the issue of in-state tuition. Now, can, can uh, any of, of you three help us lift this question up into uh, the balance, the other side of, of this argument, and put it in the kind of perspective that a hearing of this kind would require. I, I, I would uh, br briefly comment that my understanding of the of the Dream Act is that it's it's a pretty uh, common sense, uh, rational approach. What it does is repeal Section 505 of the 1996 law, which effectively uh, discouraged states from, from providing in-state tuition or other higher education uh, benefits. Uh, under that section 505, states that provide a higher education benefit based on uh, the residency of undocumented immigrants have to provide the same benefit to U.S. citizens in the same circumstances. What this simply does is uh, not require states to provide the in-state tuition uh, to, undocumented to undocumented students. It restores the decision to the states. Uh, and leaves it up to those states rather than the federal government making a requirement. So I think that's the, the fundamental issue here, uh, is that it's left to the states to, to make their own decision. That's my understanding of, of the most recent version of the law. Well, I know the author is going to weigh in on this uh, part of the discussion anyway. Uh, let me just uh, compliment Dr. Cameron, who, who lends a, a new uh, perspective to the notion that somehow minority students uh, don't have desire or capacity for math and engineering subjects. Uh, that's one that's uh, slow to die. And I sometimes uh, think that uh, it's a sort of a self-perpetuating inhibition don't you, Dr. Cameron? It's interesting you bring that point up. Uh, in our robotics competition, we really compete in what's called the Chairman's Award, and it's what have you done for our community. And the kids, quote, have to brag about themselves and how they're better, really, than a thousand other high schools in science and engineering. And uh, uh, understand our community, the, the, the average per capita income is about $9,000. By the time the kids hit the 11th grade, for most of the kids, they've exceeded the education of their parents. And yet, when they wrote their document to uh, demonstrate what has happened in their school, they said, statistically, we look like a poor school. He said, but we're probably one of the richest schools around because we're helping the junior highs, we're helping the elementary schools. They're helping other high schools and other universities form teams. And they said, when we look back at the advantages we've had over the last few years, we are one of the richest kids in the country. So, and, and they finished it by, it's not that we can beat MIT. That's not what we learned. We learned not to listen to people and not to beat ourselves. And you're exactly right. It's a self-perception. What else can we do uh, since we don't have the benefit of your presence uh, across the country or the institution? How do we begin to develop this overcoming of, of this reluctance? And, of course, it's a national phenomenon, too, when we measure engineers and scientists at, at the national level. Uh, I think China's producing eight or ten times as many uh, uh, engineers as we are. At Wayne State University in Detroit, this comes up all the time. 
it's a, I think it's a cultural phenomenon. In the United States, over the last 40, 50 years, we've become obsessed with entertainment and sports, and that's what our kids see. I honestly talked to a kid a week ago who spends 20 hours a week bouncing that basketball and honestly believes he will have a career in the NBA if he spent a fraction of that time on his math or science. When we do high schools, we ask kids, name, name, name an inventor, and they start raising their hands, who's alive, and the hands go down. And if you ask for a woman or a minority, nobody knows any of them. We hold up to our kids by our culture what's important to us. We celebrate what's important. And you don't see math and science. That's why the, the first robotics program and this hearing and our kids need to hear that. And it's not a immigration issue. That's a, a, a desperate issue for our country right now. I didn't know you were, I've got two boys, young boys. I didn't know you were going to get this personal in my family thing, <laughs> Dr. Cameron, but you did. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Uh, I now uh, turn to the gentleman from California, Mr. Lundgren, for five minutes. We've got gremlins in our microphones here today. Yeah, we're welcome. We're welcome. I've already been accused of being too close. <laughs> we'll let you over. Hello, testing one, two, three. Mr. Gomez. Is this working? Hello. Okay. Mr. Green, I paid for this microphone. A lot of you aren't old enough to remember that. Um, Ms. Frithcott Ross, uh, I would just have to tell you, I'm one of those who wants to go to comprehensive uh, legislation, but sometimes the witnesses are making it tough for me to stay there. In your comments, you mentioned the difference between you and others is merely being the difference between a piece of paper. Isn't citizenship more than just a piece of paper? I mean, I've heard some of this testimony that just the difference is that somebody has a piece of paper, somebody doesn't. Can we be concerned about the depreciation of the value of citizenship in our country when we're talking about immigration policy? I, actually, that was not me that mentioned that difference was only a piece of paper. Well, I believe I that was Congresswoman. No, I heard you say, well, I'd let the record stand for itself, but you were referring to the fact that uh, you had a piece of paper and others didn't, and that was the difference. I, I just think we ought to be very careful about appreciating the value of citizenship here. And Dr. Cameron, uh, you mentioned that at uh, Carl Hayden High School, 60 to 80 percent of the students are undocumented. Um, at least that's in your written testimony. That's not a that's not a situation that we could um, allow in this country, throughout the country, is it? Are you asking if if at Carl Hayden perhaps the percentages are higher than they are in the rest of the no, country? No, I'm just asking you. You stated that as a fact as you were talking about how well the students are doing, but isn't that part of the concern of what we should do here that we couldn't? possibly have a country in which 60 to 80 percent of the students at every high school are undocumented. We do need to have some law which will prevent that from occurring, don't you agree? Oh, absolutely, and I believe we have those laws currently. Well, they obviously aren't working, are they? They're not working in a large portion of the United States, especially in the Southwest. In Arizona, uh, there's about 500,000 undocumented people in Arizona, and the state's population is 6 million. So that's almost 10% of Arizona's undocumented. So you would suggest we do have to do something about controlling our borders? We obviously have to get a handle on our immigration, absolutely. So it, it is more than just a question of the people who are here illegally being educated, and we do a good job of educating them, and therefore we should 
give them a benefit that is denied um, students who are citizens but are out of state. Wouldn't you agree? On uh, the public school system, any child that lives in the public school neighborhood is is but aren't we talking about public the here? Yeah, I'm at the high school. At the university level, I think uh, by merit, well, let me put it this way. In, in the graduate levels of engineering across the United States, 50% of the people in the master's and the Ph.D. programs are international students. So let's talk about undergraduate. We have a member of Congress, Mr. Bill Bray, who left this place for a while, had his family here while he was a member of Congress. One of his children attended high school here. Um, attempted to go to a um, California State College or University and was charged out-of-state uh, out state tuition. Um, you wouldn't think that's fair, would you? I, you're really talking to the wrong person because I haven't changed states, but in Arizona, it was if you graduated from a high school in Arizona and, and you could show residency in the state for the last year or two, you would have in-state tuition. I'm just trying to show you why we have a real difficulty in putting a bill together because there are people who think that's unfair. Congressman Bill Bray being charged out-of-state tuition for his child and yet children in California who are here illegally are having in-state. Um, I, I just, this is a, a very difficult issue that we have to deal with and I appreciate your comments and I appreciate the tremendous um, uh, academic achievement of the young people you're talking about. But again, I go back to the question of what we pass, at least I think we have an obligation of thinking about the um, consequences of what we pass, whether or not it leads to a situation in which we have more schools that will be 60 to 80 percent undocumented aliens um, versus less. Uh, when I was here back in the 70s and 80s, I said, if we don't get this right, if we don't solve the illegal immigration problem now, it won't just be a regional problem, it'll be a national problem. And now it is. And, and that's one of the concerns I have. And, and Mr. Marisadis, I appreciate your comments and how difficult it is uh, for a lot of students. I would just say my wife is the first person to, to graduate from eighth grade in her, in her uh, family. Um, no one, me as well. had, no one had even thought of going to college in her family. Her dad died when she was young. Her mother was on Social Security. My wife went to college because Social Security gave an additional grant to the family if she stayed in, in college. Um, there are a lot of people in difficult situations in this country who are here legally, and so I'm not sure that that's the disparity we ought to be looking at. We ought to be evaluating this, yes, on ultimate fairness. It seems to me what's best for the United States, but also the long-term consequences of what we do. Thank you, Madam Chair. Gentlemen's time has expired. I turn now to the gentleman from California, Mr. Berman. Uh, assume nothing happens, uh, Dr. Cameron, in, uh, in Congress. Uh, tell me, the, describe the future for the 60 to 80 percent of the schools of students who are undocumented. Predicting the future, of course, is a little difficult. First of all, uh, understand if you're 16 years old, I put myself in, in, I try to put myself in the minds of some of these kids. If I was 16 years old and I was a sophomore and I realized I don't get a driver's license, which is the badge of adulthood, I'm not going to get a social security number and frankly, I'm not going to really get a job. I'm not going to go to college. Why am I in high school? I can get a job now at 16, and a lot of 16-year-olds do. I think I would be very tempted to drop out of school, because what's the point of getting a high school education? And yet, most of them do graduate. They do get a high school diploma. So if the DREAM Act is not passed, will we see an increase in the dropout rate? I would think we would. But they're not going to leave. They may drop out of school, but they're not going to drop out of Phoenix or Arizona or the United States. They're going to get married. They're going to have children who will be citizens. They're going to live here until they're old and can't work anymore. They will not be allowed to take a, they will not be part of the safety net. They won't be getting Medicare. They won't be getting uh, the social services except for medical help in an emergency. And these people are going to live here for the rest of their lives. So what will happen to them? I don't know. But look what will happen to us. We'll have lost one of the important assets of our country, young, intelligent people, 
who get educated or join the military, they contribute to our society, and as they grow older, they produce more and pass that on to their children. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Kovac, uh, uh, <clears throat> here I become a witness. Uh, you write in your prepared testimony, in effect, the DREAM Act, uh, which I got the sense of from the, quote, anecdotal story in around 1999 uh, and introduced for the first time in 2001, uh, repeal at you correctly described that it repeals that provision of the 1996 law that I might point out for the record I didn't vote for. Um, uh, you said, this is no accidental turn of phrase. This retroactive repeal was inserted as a direct response to the lawsuits, in parenthesis, brought by you, uh, uh, challenging the states that violated the 1996 federal law. Wrong. I didn't know about those lawsuits because they weren't brought until 2004 and 2005. I did it because the stories I heard laid out a future that these witnesses have described. What are we losing by this situation? Uh, what is the country losing? What's happening to them? What's their motivation to continue to excel in if facing the brick wall that they would face uh, under the current situation? So I just want to uh, correct for the record: it was it wasn't done because of your lawsuits. It was done before your lawsuits. Uh, um, and what what happened to your lawsuit in Kansas? Um, <clears throat> with respect to what you said first about the uh, well, uh, no, let's first slide, let's answer the, just the, what happened to the okay. lawsuit. In well, Kansas. I'd like to respond also to the language of the statute, if I might. Okay. After that, the uh, lawsuit in Kansas was the plaintiffs uh, were it was dismissed on the basis of standing and private right of action. The judge and never it, got to the merits, which and it's on appeal. The, and, and the question of standing and private right of action is on appeal before the Tenth Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals. And now, what, what happened to the lawsuit in California? And, so the judges, and the judge never got to the question of whether the states were violating federal law. Right. The lawsuit in California was uh, brought in a state county court. Uh, the judge there had basically the mirror image uh, opinion. He said that the state, the students do have standing and do have a private right of action. But then in a, sort of a three three sentence summary, he said, but we don't think the state's violating the law and basically kicked it onto the appeals court where it is now. So it's basically the states aren't saying, we're going to give undocumented students in-state tuition. The states are saying, we're giving people who live in our state and graduate from high school in-state tuition. But only if you're unlawfully present and if you... No, because I know some lawfully present in-state residents who are getting in-state tuition. And those are the issues that are on dispute before the court. But if I might add about the language of the DREAM Act, as you know, it's gone through several versions now, and we're on probably version 4.0 at this point. So if I was incorrect in stating that the retroactive repeal uh, came in the original version, I apologize. I thought it came in the 2006 version. The gentleman's time has expired, and the correction is noted for the record. And uh, the ranking member has returned. Would you like to take... We'll go to Mr. Gomer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chairwoman, this has uh, been an interesting hearing. You've called a number of very helpful and informative hearings, and we appreciate that. Um, and I, for whoever is allowing some microphones to work and others not to, I appreciate <laughs> appreciate the fact that mine apparently is. Um, but I. Uh, was reading and hearing Professor Kovitz's um, statement, and my friend Mr. Berman was getting into this, but it is interesting, uh, the paradox here, um, apparently, and I hadn't thought of it in these terms till your comments, but 
this provides an amnesty bill for states, I guess, uh, one way of looking at it. Does uh, the gentleman yield? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'd, certainly. Or you could view it as repealing a bad law, hmm. which provides amnesty for those who were violating the bad law from that perspective. But uh, in any event, thank you. Uh, one of the things that drove me off the bench and to run for Congress was something that broke my heart, and that was uh, I was seeing people who were spurred into activity that led them into a rut they couldn't seem to get out of. I know back in the 60s, Congress had the best of intentions. They saw single women who were who had children with no help financially from deadbeat dads. So uh, the answer they felt like, let's help them. These people need help. They deserve help. Let's give them a check for every child they have out of wedlock. Forty years later, we've gotten what we pay for. The old adage, uh, power to tax is the power to destroy, I think is true. The power to reward is also the power to create or increase. So, <laughs> In terms of what we do as a Congress, we really have to look at the long-term effects. If we make something financially advantageous, then normally that is going to create more of the condition that is made more financially advantageous. No matter how well-meaning, how well-intentioned, um, if one makes an activity financially more rewarding, you're going to get more of that activity. That's the nature of the human. So I, I'm struggling with this, and it, it looks like, you know, when we hear the circumstances of these three wonderful young people um, who do touch my heart, I, I keep coming back, though. Let's keep things in perspective. What are we going to reward? What are we going to encourage by legislation? What are we going to create for the future by rewarding things today? So those are the things that perplex me. Each of your testimony, uh, both written and oral, has been helpful. And I thank you and yield back, Madam Chair. Gentleman yields back. And I, I will um, recognize the ranking member. Can't hear. Gentlemen could use mine. <laughs> Steve King, come on down. <laughs> well, we'll restart your five minutes when you find a working microphone, Mr. Ranking Member. <laughs> Is it, isn't anyone on House Administration here, Dan? <laughs> okay, Madam Chair, I think you can activate that clock. Uh, I, I thank you. I thank the witnesses for your testimony. Uh, I, I uh, read through most of it, heard some of it, had to come in and out, so uh, there's some gaps in my in my uptake here too. But um, it occurs to me this, and I'm directing, in a way, uh, Ms. Roth's testimony, and you talked about the shortage of labor that we have. And uh, certainly I, I agree that uh, our highly skilled labor, uh, there's something we can do there to enhance our economy. But let me propose this um, analogy to you and to the rest of the witnesses there. And that is, just say, imagine, here we are, the United States of America, 300 million people. Imagine this, if we're all, we're all in this together, aren't we? And so we have to work together like a family in a way, and we have some people taking care of the children, some people taking care of the health care, some people going off to work, others taking care of things at home, some being educated, some retired, kind of like a multi-generational family, United States of America. Now imagine all 300 million of us in this huge family being in a giant clipper ship all together, some riding back in steerage, some up in, uh, in their staterooms depending upon their means, some down there pulling on the oars, some trimming the sails, some taking care of charting our course, which I think Congress is doing, and an argument going on up on the bridge that 
we need more labor, we need more people to trim the sails and pull on the oars, uh, where are we going to get them? Uh, the president and uh, Senator Kennedy and those on that side argue that we ought to pull off over onto this continent called Amnestistan and load up as many as we can because seven out of every 12 will work and the other five go down into steerage to take place with the 156 million that are passengers right now in this giant clipper ship America. Um, the other side of the argument is why don't we go down to the, down to steerage where there are those people that are riding along that are passengers, the 156 million, and recruit just one out of ten of them and have them come up and help us up here on deck so we can sail this ship a little more efficiently. Now, if we take on too many passengers, this ship sinks. If we take on too many that are uh, riding down in steerage or too many that are up in the stateroom for that matter, uh, we can't, we can't navigate because we sink lower and lower in the water. And so if we're going to chart this course down the rule of law, and if we're going to be a prosperous nation, and, and the statement I will say is that the success of the strength of a nation is directly proportional to the average individual productivity of each of its people, citizens or not, inside the border of the United States. So wouldn't we want to enhance that productivity of the average citizen? Wouldn't we want to go down there into steerage and recruit one out of ten of those people, one out of ten of those 69 million that are of working age and just simply not in the workforce? rather than pull off over to Amnesty Stand and load up, uh, load up a bunch of people, uh, many of whom are illiterate in their own language and unskilled, and we know they can't contribute to this economy, not in this generation or the next. Now, God love them all, but this ship sinks. We can't take on $6.3 billion, so how would you resolve that if you were on the bridge involved in that debate? This is a case where anecdote and economic data come together. Yes. We have a 66% labor force participation rate. We have a 4.5% unemployment rate. There's jobs for everybody who wants it. In your ship example, the people who aren't rowing, the people who aren't working, aren't doing so because they want to. They have chosen to do other things. On the other hand, we have people coming from other countries who want to do a lot of these jobs. There are a lot of jobs both in the very high skill area and the very low skill area that Americans don't want to do. And it's wrong. Do. We have. Do you, do you acknowledge that everyone who comes here doesn't go to work? I, I acknowledge everyone who comes here wants to work. Immigrants you do. who come here want to work. Do you know that well, five out of 12 are not rate. working who come here? Do the, you acknowledge that? The unemployment rate for immigrants is lower than that for native born American work. But do you disagree with that statistic that five out of 12? are not working, that 7 out of 12 are of the immigrants that come here? I mean, you don't get 100% participation right. I mean, I think you just said that they all want to work. I don't think we can actually say that and be objective about the facts. We can objectively say the unemployment rate for uh, foreign-born workers is lower than the unemployment rate for native-born workers. What is the difference in that percentage, can you tell me? Uh, it's uh, probably about half a percentage point right now. It's, it's, it's very marginal, it's isn't it? I mean, you can say that, but when you look at it objectively, it's very similar no. U.S. Well, participation uh, rates. And, and it has varied over time, but when you have a 4.5% unemployment rate, half a percentage point is very significant. Would you, would you take the position that, um, that you're only limited when it comes to expanding our employment base in this country to hiring from the unemployed, or would you agree that there are, that there are as I said, 69 million people who are simply not in the workforce a small percentage of them are part of the unemployment, around six million or so. The balance of that are people who are who are not working because they haven't been offered something that causes them to go to work. They haven't been bid for their services. Would you agree with that? No, I wouldn't. I would say that people who are not participating in the labor force right now in the United States are not participating because they choose not to participate. But would you Even disagree with my statistics? Or they're in school. Pardon? Would you disagree with my statistics? Uh, you would have to cite the precise statistic to have the U.S. Department of Labor. I would say that your interpretation that the people who are not participating in the workforce, when we only have, as I said, 66% uh, participation right now, the people who are not participating are doing so out of choice, not because they are discouraged workers. The yeah. Bureau of Labor Statistics also produces data on discouraged workers. But that's so also true with illegal immigrants. I'm sorry we ran out of time. I appreciate it. I yield back the balance of my time. The time has expired, and I will uh, take my brief time for questions at this point. Um, I think this has been a very interesting uh, panel, and I, I want to, I, I know I won't have a chance to ask all my questions, uh, but uh, Ms. First Goth Roth, would you say, I mean, let's just take a look at the, the three young women here who have gotten their education as an example. 
Is there an economic downside to America to allowing them to fully participate with their education so that you can identify for us? On, on the country, uh, there's an economic upside. We need more workers and uh, we need more skilled workers and we also, by the way, need more unskilled workers. Immigrants in general uh, uh, tend to be very highly skilled, such as the ones who are behind me here, and also low skilled. Right, we don't uh, want the Ameri PhDs picking the strawberries. Right, and, and uh, Americans tend to have a bell-shaped uh, uh, um, curve of skills where we do not have a lot of low-skilled adult workers and we don't have a lot of Americans who want to be PhDs. Right. In science. I'll, I would just note that the, the figure we have is that 96% of undocumented men uh, in, in America are in the labor force because they've come to work. Um, I, you know, thinking about you, Dr. Cameron, I was, I went back to check my introduction that says you're retired. That is so disappointing to me. I hope that's not true because what a phenomenal teacher, uh, you obviously are. Are you still participating in the robotics program? Oh, absolutely. I just don't get paid. You just don't get paid. <laughs> I'm one of the unemployed. One of the unemployed. You're not participating in the workforce. No, you're not participating in the workforce. Um, I, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a frequent observer of the uh, first robotics competition in California. And one of the things that uh, I've seen just transform schools, and especially uh, including schools where, you know, the parents haven't gone to college. It, it is a working class environment. I'm the first in my family to go to college, for example, and and, and I know that uh, when when one's parents has not gone to college, it's not that they don't want you to do well, it's just that sometimes they don't know all the tricks of the trade. They don't know how to apply for things, and so you're sort of trying to figure that out on your own. And robotics does something that's phenomenal in these schools. It gets young people focused on science and education it increases their self-confidence and then that your school of, of students from families where the parents didn't go to college beat MIT is really I'm sure they were very proud how did it feel for you, for these students that they they having beaten MIT they weren't allowed to go beat them again in the competition in Canada uh, Understand it's a high school, so you graduate the seniors right. each year, and they're replaced by freshmen, so so you don't have the same kids over four years. Uh, a lot of the kids kind of feel bad because they don't get their chance to compete. However, this year we are going to, since since it's ironic that the National Underwater Robotics Competition, funded partially by the National Science Foundation, has been outsourced to Canada. Uh, so we figured, well, then there's not one in the United States. So we're holding the National Underwater Robotics uh, Championship in Chandler, Arizona, and there'll be about a dozen schools there. So the kids might be a little disappointed that they're not playing in, in, in the game they played, but now they're holding their own game. So they're not just the, the engineers. They're also the audiovisual, the hustlers, the people that are... That we could use those audiovisual people here today. <laughs> <laughs> they're available. Uh, so it escalates. So instead of being the the players, now they're the the participants and the, the organizers. I, I would just like to say, and I know that this has gone on uh, for a long time. I'm not going to go over my time, uh, but that uh, this has been an education for me here today to hear um, the testimony of professional people on the stat statistics and and the experiences. Uh, is important, and we've done a, a considerable amount of that uh, in the last month. Uh, this is the 12th hearing that we've had. But um, in back of you, you can't see this because you're looking at the committee, and back of you are sitting the, uh, these phenomenal three young women uh, who I am inspired by. And uh, as we think through, I, Mr. Berman is right, uh, we sort through policy, but policy must be informed by humanity. And I actually voted against the 96 Act as well. I didn't think it was right for Congress to preempt the decision-making of states. At that time, I still don't. Uh, but I also, just for the life of me, cannot see how America benefits if three women, like these young women, who've gotten their degrees, who love the United States, who said the Pledge of Allegiance over and over again, 
who are ready to just take off are not permitted to do so. I just don't see how our country is strengthened if we permit if, if we don't permit that. And uh, my time is expired, so I will, uh, uh, unless it is compelling, I will um, bring this um, hearing to a close, noting that the record uh, will be open for five days, and members may um, submit questions for the record if questions are forwarded to the witnesses, we would ask that you respond, uh, if you can, as promptly as possible. I would like also to extend an invitation to everyone here today to extend our next hearing on comprehensive immigration reform. We will have one next Tuesday afternoon at 2 o'clock when we will hear perspectives on immigration reform from faith-based and immigrant communities. On Thursday at 9 in the morning next week, we will hear uh, perspectives on immigration reform from members of the labor movement. And with that, and with thanks, this hearing is adjourned.